You know, in the last video, we discussed about the risk-adjusted capital ratio, and we learned that risk-adjusted capital ratio is essentially is the ratio of regulatory capital um, divided by the risk-adjusted asset. And we learned how we estimate the numerator of this ratio, which is regulatory capital. So in this video, we will mostly discuss about how we calculate the denominator of this ratio, that means risk-adjusted assets. Uh, determination of the denominator of this uh, risk-adjusted capital ratio is complex and is made up of the risk-adjusted assets or assets equivalents resulting from credit risk, operational risk, market risk, and securitization. For most depository institutions, a large portion of risk-adjusted asset is made up of credit risk-related assets and off balance sheet activities. Uh, now, the process of measuring credit risk adjusted asset comprises two parts. One is credit risk associated with on balance sheet assets and credit risk associated with off balance sheet assets. Um, first of all, with regard to on balance sheet activities, uh, you know, in simple terms, this approach requires the weighting of each asset by a risk weight and adding the weighted assets together to obtain the total on balance sheet the risk adjusted assets. Now, there are five risk weights, uh, each based on risk classes determined by either external credit rating agencies or fixed risk weights prescribed by APRA, and each reflects the likelihood of counterparty default. Um, the five risk weights are 0%, 20%, 50%, 100%, and 150%, which covers the majority of Australian depository institution assets. So the, if we look at this table, it shows the details relationship between the Basel II risk weights and external ratings of both long and short term assets. Okay, so you can see um, that uh, these assets have a zero weighting, then the assets that has this different rating, so they are great and they are weighting. Okay, so these are the weights. Now, a number of uh, asset classes have zero risk weighting, including cash, cash equivalents, deposits with RBA, and claims on Australian government. However, the most depository institution assets have positive risk weighting, uh, reflecting positive default risk. In general, only assets with a very high credit rating will have a rating of less than 100%. Residential housing loans receive a special, a special attention under the capital rules. This is because their default risk probabilities are impacted by loan to valuation ratios and the incidence of mortgage insurance. So um, we, were, we were talking about this. Now, the, once you have um, the, those assets estimated and their risk weighting, then we apply this formula. So credit risk adjusted on balance sheet assets. So we simply get the dollar value of our asset on the balance sheet and we multiply its risk weight and we sum them up to get the credit risk adjusted on balance sheet assets. Here is an example we have. Uh, suppose that a financial institution holds the following assets, notes and coins, 20 million, local government bonds, 10 million, loans to other Australian banks with a credit rating of triple B, a positive 5 million residential mortgage loan, loan to value ratio is less than 90%, uh, rated A with 40 million, corporate loans with a credit rating of then, double B, so 25 million, and corporate loans with a credit rating of B plus is 20 million, and total asset of 120 million. Now, uh, this is what the balance sheet assets, now we need to calculate risk-adjusted assets. Uh, and as we have said that to calculate risk-adjusted asset, you can see that each asset needs to be multiplied by its risk weighting, okay? So this is what I'm talking about, risk weighting. This and this. 
So for each of these assets, which was 20 million, 10 million, 40 million, 25 million, so each of these assets are multiplied by their risk weighting and risk weighting comes from this table as I indicated earlier. And finally, we get uh, this risk adjusted asset, which is the $78 million. So you can see that although the total asset of uh, this uh, financial institution was way higher, but risk adjusted asset is $78 million. And as we previously learned, I mean, in the last video that how we calculate capital um, uh, risk adjusted capital ratio. So, and we have seen that um, the, the, uh, this capital ratio uh, must be greater or equal to 8%, if you can remember this. We have learned it in last video that total regulatory capital uh, to risk adjusted ratio must be 8%, which is uh, the total regulatory capital divided by total risk adjusted asset. It must be greater or equal to 8%. Now, since we have a risk adjusted asset of 82 million, and uh, if we uh, multiply it by 8%, so what we get is um, 6.56% 6 million in capital. So it means that um, uh, the the financial institution must have at least 6.56 million in capital uh, since it has an 82 million dollar of risk adjusted asset. As a result, its regulatory capital ratio will be 8%, which is um, the regulatory requirement for depository institutions in Australia. Now about the off balance sheet activities, um, the value of risk adjusted on balance sheet assets that we have just discussed is only one component of the credit risk adjustments required for the denominator of the capital adequacy ratio. The other is the credit risk adjusted value of the bank's all balance sheet activities, including the market related transactions, uh, and non-market related transactions. So market related transactions can be foreign exchange, interest rate, and other forward option, swap contracts transactions. On the other hand, non-market related transactions can be contingent loans, guarantees, underwriting, um, trade or performance related commitments. We learned them earlier. A depository institution's total risk weighted all balance sheet in the credit exposure is the sum of the risk weighted amount of all its market related and non market related transactions. Uh, one point I, one additional point I want to tell you here that this off balance sheet activities um, contracts can be of two types. One is the exchange traded contract, and another is the bilaterally agreed contract. Exchange traded contracts, for example, futures are mostly standardized contracts. They are traded in organized exchanges. That's why they typically do not have credit risk. On the other hand, the bilaterally agreed contracts, for example, forward contracts are the mostly uh, customized and um, the contracts are made between two parties. They are typically not traded in organized exchanges. That's why they, they uh, have the credit risk. Now, to estimate the credit risk exposure for a depository institution's of balance sheet activities, we undertake a two-step process. First, um, the, the notional amount of the transaction must be converted into um, an on-balance sheet equivalent called a credit equivalent amount, CEA. The CEA is determined by multiplying the notional amount by a credit conversion factor, which is um, specified by APRA in APS 112 in Australia. The second step requires that the resulting CEA, that means credit equivalent amount, must be multiplied by the appropriate risk weight. The credit risk on a market related off balance sheet um, transaction is the cost of replacing the cash flow specified by the contract in the event of default by the counterparty. Most market-related off-balance sheet contracts are over-the-counter contracts, which um, originate outside organized exchanges and are not covered by the eligible bilateral, bilateral netting agreement. So this is the point I just discussed. The next point we are going to discuss is um, the, the operational risk based capital charge. To determine the regulatory capital charge for operational risk similar to credit risk, depository institution 
can either uh, follow a standardized approach or an advanced approach. The use of sophisticated internal models under the advanced approach requires the APRAS prior approval and in practice the depository institutions using the internal rating models for credit risk are only those using the advanced approach. And so we will be discussing um, a standardized approach here. To calculate the operational the risk capital charge, the depository institutions activities are firstly divided into three areas. Those are retail banking, commercial retail banking, commercial banking, and all other activities. The capital charge on retail and commercial banking is a proportion of depository institutions total gross outstanding loans and advances. Total retail and commercial gross outstanding loans and advances are defined as the total exposure um, of uh, the balance sheet items, um, for example, for retail, cash holdings on notes and coins, um, loans to households, and for commercial deposits and amounts due from financial institutions, securities held in the banking book and commercial lending. The operational risk capital measurement of all other activities, a proportion of depository institutions' net income after exclusion of any net income related to retail and commercial banking activities. The adjusted gross income figure includes net interest income and servicing fee income from securitization, trading and corporate finance activities, plus any income from less regular or one of activities that the depository institution may engage in from time to time. The total operational risk regulatory capital uh, under the standardized approach to operational risk is found using uh, a particular formula. Uh, the formula is um, available in the textbook, um, the page number 663, so which essentially is uh, the sum of the all these um, the three activities uh, dividing by a particular factor uh, approached by APRA and multiplied by uh, these ratios um, that's total gross outstanding loans and advances for retail lending, total gross loans outstanding for commercial lending, and um, the adjusted gross loan income. And once um, we have these, uh, then we can, we multiply it, I mean the capital charge is multiplied by this 12.5, so we get the operational risk weighted asset equivalent. Now we are going to discuss uh, two capital buffers. In addition to a new definition of capital, changes to the capital adequacy ratios and inclusion of a leverage ratio within the framework of pillar one, Basel III introduced two capital buffers, a capital conservation buffer and a counter-cyclical capital buffer. The capital buffers are designed to address the pro-cyclicality, uh, thereby raising the resilience of financial system to withstand shocks. First of all, the capital conservation buffer is 2.5% of risk weighted assets. That means financial institution must hold 2.5% capital of its risk adjusted asset as capital conservation buffer. So that be, must be comprised of common equity tire one only. This means that depository institution must hold a minimum of 7% of common equity tire one capital to the risk adjusted asset. Because you can remember that common equity tire one the capital requirement was 4.5% and this capital conservation by the buffer is 2.5 percent so financial institution must hold seven percent common equity tire one capital ratio altogether with this buffer depository institutions will build up capital to absorb losses during periods of financial and economic stress if a depository institution's capital conservation buffers fall below 2.5 percent constraints are imposed on the depository institutions distributions providing a further incentive to depository institution to meet the buffer at all times. 
The countercyclical capital buffer, on the other hand, has a macroeconomic focus and aims to ensure that financial system uh, capital requirements are sufficient given the uh, macro financial environment in which depository institutions operate. The buffer is designed to ensure the financial system has an additional buffer of capital to protect it against future potential losses. It acts like an extension to the capital conservation buffer, but it is not permanent. APRA determines when the countercyclical capital buffer is to be deployed when excess aggregate credit growth is associated with a buildup of systemic, system wide risk, and it is expected that these will be infrequent. APRA reviews the need for the buffer in consultation with RBA and publicly announces if it is to be applied. The buffer will vary between 0 and 2.5% of total risk weighted assets and is to be met with common equity tier 1 capital only. So as we previously discussed about the three pillars of Basel III, Basel II is in part to ensure depository institutions have enough capital to uh, support depository institutions risk, it stresses managerial responsibility and accountability for risk measurement uh, and management. Capital adequacy states clearly that depository institutions board of directors must ensure that the depository institution has adequate capital commensurate with risk exposure in its portfolio of activities and as a minimum must have adequate systems and procedures to identify, measure, monitor and manage its risk and the capital management plan. Under the pillar two, APRA determines prudential capital ratios for each depository institution, not less than the, the regulated minimum. Pillar three, uh, on the other hand, has a purpose to encourage market discipline through an information disclosure framework covering capital, capital adequacy, risk exposures, and risk assessment process within a depository institution. Pillar 3 requests um, uh, quantitative disclosures for capital structure, capital adequacy, and risk exposure. Qualitative disclosures are required about depository institutions' risk management processes. The disclosure requirement allow all market participants to review and compare the risk characteristics of depository um, the, of Australian depository institutions. So this is the end of um, our discussion this week. Thank you very much.